Hey guys, it's Sean. This is the Panasonic Lumix GX85, and it's the camera that I've been shooting on for just over a year now. Um, now, before we get started in this video, I want you guys to know that I'm not someone who likes to overhype gear um, when giving recommendations. And the reason for that is because I think as content creators, um, many of us are on very tight budgets, and we need to make the most of every single dollar we have. And the only way we're gonna do that is by knowing exactly what kind of gear we are buying. But with that said, I think I'm in love with this camera. Um, if it wasn't for this camera, I dare say that I would have never gotten as far as I have with videography. That's a very bold claim. And so in this video, I'm going to talk about um, why I chose this camera to begin with, along with giving you three reasons why you might consider this camera and three reasons why you might want to look somewhere else. All right, let's get started. So before I got my Lumix GX85 in 2019, uh, I shot on this bad boy. This is the Canon 600D or otherwise known as the T3i in the United States. And fun fact, my dad actually won this camera at a lucky draw which meant that I got the camera body and a kit lens for free. <laughs> this is how my photography and videography journey started. Um, in 2017, I added a Yongno 50mm f1.8 lens uh, to my collection, which I got for about 250 ringgit from Lazada, so it was dirt cheap. Um, and I rocked that out to shoot videos in school and on my exchange program. Now, there were some very serious limitations with that setup, not gonna lie. Um, first being that in video mode, you had to shoot in live view, and that means that it's the poor contrast detect autofocus points on the sensor that are being used. Autofocus was never great to begin with, and when you pair that up with a 50mm f1.8 lens, yeah, um, almost unusable. I ended up using manual focus almost all the time, which meant that it was very inconvenient when I had fast moving subjects in a shot. Another thing that was inconvenient was the fact that there was no stabilization in this camera, nor was that stabilization in the lens. And a lot of the workflow, the editing workflow I had revolved around me just adding warp stabilization in the clips, which took up so much time. And in the end, the results, sometimes they weren't great either. Um, you would see lots of shakiness, warpiness in the, in the video because of the digital stabilization. Some shots just can't be saved. So I realized that I needed to get a camera that would help me out with autofocus and stabilization. Those were pretty important, but I wasn't that demanding of a user when it came to autofocus, which meant that I wasn't too concerned about Panasonic's poor reputation for autofocus. So when I decided that I wanted to take videography um, a lot more seriously, I did my research and I found this Lumix GX85 on VH Photo for $350. It came with two kit lenses. It came with the Pancake 12 to 35, uh, 12 to 32, sorry. And it came with the Telephoto 45 to 150, which eventually I sold because um, I don't really do that much wildlife or have a use case for that. Now at the time, I think it was the cheapest uh, 4K capable mirrorless interchangeable lens camera on the market. And although I initially wanted a Lumix GH5 or a G9, um, I realized that with a tight budget, it would make more sense to cut back on the body and put my money into the lenses because there was no point in getting such a good camera if I didn't have the lenses to use for various shoots. After all, in the worst case, if I hated this camera in the end, um, I could just relegate this camera to become my B cam and uh, get a Lumix GH5 or G9 in the future. This camera body ended up costing me about 2,000 ringgit uh, after factoring in import taxes and shipping fees to Malaysia. And uh, I proceeded to get this Sigma 30mm f1.4 contemporary lens um, to use for video shoots in school and outside of school. Okay, that's enough with the lenses and all. Let's get back to the camera and let me tell you why I love this camera so much. Reason number one to consider the Lumix GX85, high quality 4K video. So for this, let's swap out the Lumix GF9, which is recording me at the moment in 1080p, with the Lumix GX85 and record it with the same lens in 4K. Here we go. All right, we're shooting on the Lumix GX85 with the Sigma 16mm f1.4 in 4K. And you might realize that the frame is actually slightly cropped a little, and that's because the Lumix GX85 shoots uh, 4K with the 1.1 times crop. Yeah, personally, I don't think this is a problem at all. It's pretty negligible, but if you do lots of wide angle 
um, videography, you might want to consider the G9 and GH5 if 4K video uncropped is important to you. That aside, if you're into cameras, you might know that Lumix has a good reputation for delivering great image quality um, on their cameras. And so the jump from 1080p video on the Canon 600D to the Lumix GX85 was just uh, mind-blowing. Even with the pancake kit lens and the relatively affordable uh, Sigma 30mm f1.4, I was astounded at how crisp the image quality was. Um, in fact, lately I had the chance to shoot on my church's Nikon Z6, which was a joy to shoot for photography, but when it came down to 4K image quality in good light and you know where dynamic range was not too demanding, I think the Lumix stood up to the full frame Nikon in terms of sharpness and detail. And that's just crazy considering how um, affordable the Lumix is. It's a fraction of the, of the price, it's one third of the price of the Nikon body only. Now I know what you might be thinking, um, hey Sean, if I'm just gonna be uploading to online platforms such as YouTube and Facebook where people don't even watch in 1080p, what's the point of shooting 4K or finding a camera that can shoot 4K? Wouldn't I be better off just shooting 1080p because I can render faster and edit faster? Um, and you know what, you'll be right, but there are still a couple of reasons that I insist on shooting 4K. Um, firstly, learn to render proxies for your videos. I promise it makes editing so much faster uh, on lower end laptops and computers. I personally edit on a Dell XPS 13 2018, which is by no means a power user's laptop. And I find that with proxies, my editing workflow is as smooth as me editing in 1080p. Secondly, shooting 4K allows you the flexibility to crop and downsample uh, in post-production if you're exporting in 1080p at the end. But the biggest reason to shoot and upload in 4K is that YouTube actually re-encodes every single one of your videos into either the AVC codec or the VP9 codec. Um, the first one, the AVC codec, takes less time to process but is inferior in video quality whereas um, the second one, the VP9 codec, is superior in video quality but takes longer to edit. Preferably, you want to force YouTube to use the VP9 codec and to do this, you either have to have thousands of views on your YouTube videos or you could upload in 1440p or 4K. And that's what makes the GX85 so compelling, um, especially for someone who does paid professional work. Not only am I able to tell my clients, hey, I shoot 4K, but the videos that they get and they upload on social media will also benefit from better compression. I think that is a huge selling point. Best part about shooting in 4K on the GX85, there's no record limit and there are no overheating problems. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but that's for some reason a feature to be happy with in 2020. All right, the second reason you should consider a Lumix GX85, in-body image stabilization or IBIS. Now this has been a lifesaver for me for so many shoots I've done and yeah, I think it's just increased my video production quality by leaps and bounds over the Canon 600D. Now, interestingly, the 5-axis in-body image stabilization on the Lumix GX85 was one of Lumix's first on the Micro Four Thirds system, at least for video. If I'm not mistaken, I think the GX8 had IBIS, but it was only in photo mode. So with that in mind, I think Lumix absolutely hit it out of the park with this. Basically with IBIS, your image sensor is able to move and that means that your camera is able to shift the sensor to compensate for any shaky movements you make. So yeah, having IBIS is great for a few things. First off, for non-extreme focal lengths, maybe between 24 and 100 mil uh, full frame equivalent, IBIS usually performs better than lens stabilization which only usually allows two axes to be compensated for. Secondly, it lets you use non-stabilized lenses, which is great because not all lenses, uh, especially prime lenses such as this Sigma over here, um, have stabilization. And the ones which do, they cost, they cost a lot more. In video applications, here's a comparison of me doing basic pans, tilts, and static shots with my Lumix GX85 with IBIS on the left and the Lumix GF9 without IBIS on the right. Both were shot using the same Sigma 30mm f1.4 at the same video setting so you can decide how important IBIS might be for your use case. It should also be noted that you should never expect IBIS to completely smoothen out more dynamic movements such as walking or running, but I will say that it is still much more pleasing than without stabilization at all. 
Here's a walking test with the Lumix 20mm f1.7 on the two cameras. First handheld and second uh, with my Feiyutech AK2000 gimbal. Once again, all the video settings are the same and hopefully with the video side by side, you can decide for yourself how much stabilization you need for the work that you do. Personally, I find that balancing a gimbal is pretty time consuming, so I reserve it just for the occasions when I know I'll be on a controlled set, or at least have the time to prepare my gimbal. I still prefer to shoot handheld for events, and that means that IBIS has become basically a necessity for me. There's actually one more application where IBIS can prove to be very useful, and that's for low light photography involving non moving subjects. Uh, conventionally, uh, when shooting handheld, there's a rule where on non-stabilized systems, the shutter speed ought to be faster than 1 over full frame equivalent focal length. And that means if you're shooting on uh, a 30mm lens on Micro Four Thirds, you multiply that by 2 and you get 60, um, which means your shutter speed has to be faster than 1 60th of a second to prevent um, handheld shakiness from causing your photos to become blurry. But see, with IBIS, all of that gets thrown out the window. The Lumix GX85's IBIS has allowed me to confidently shoot one fifth of a second shutter speed on focal lengths wider than 50, and maybe up to one tenth on focal lengths longer than that. And this is huge for things like nighttime architectural photography or landscape photography, or even indoor product photography, where an extra three stops of light could prove to be the difference between ISO 6400 and ISO 800. In fact, even for group photos and portraits, because people are trying to stay still, you can benefit from IBIS because you can now hold exposures down to 1 20th of a second or so, and that's just super useful. Obviously, if you're shooting sports, concerts, action, or any genre of photography that involves moving subjects, IBIS won't be much help for that, and so you might want to look at faster lenses or larger sized um, APS-C or full frame cameras to compensate for the fast shutter speeds you might have. Personally, I just shoot travel photography and you know, that's about it. But I will say that being able to rely on IBIS, even if it's just once in a while, has proven to be super convenient in non-video applications and that's why I love the Lumix GX85 so much. Reason number three to consider the Lumix GX85 has to be the Micro Four Thirds lens selection. Now, I don't think I'm going to ever be able to get over my gear acquisition syndrome, but it does help a lot when there are many affordable Micro Four Thirds lenses to select from when building a lens ecosystem. The great thing is that many of the affordable lower-end native lenses are already several years old, and that means that you can find amazing used deals online, especially if you're someone who's just looking to start uh, their photography journey. Um, I think the best deal I found has to be this Pancake 20mm f1.7, which I found for 450 ringgit or $100 or so from Malaysian camera shop uh, Shashinki. I don't think it's a lens that I could really beat for the price that I found it for. If you want a larger aperture and maybe slightly better optics, the Sigma Contemporary line with their 16mm, 30mm and 56mm f1.4 lenses make up an incredibly versatile lens collection for around 1200 to 1600 ringgit each. Um, I run these three lenses for all my serious video work, including this one, and you know, I've never had any complaints about image quality. And you know, obviously if you want the best of the best and money is no object, there are Leica branded lenses like the 10-25 to f1.7, um, the 42.5mm Noctichron, and the Olympus Pro f1.2 primes, uh, though I doubt I can justify them over my current Sigma contemporary set. Yes, you'll never be able to get the bookalicious full frame f1.4 shallow depth of field with these lenses due to the physical limitation of the sensor size, but I think for a beginner photographer or videographer, simply being able to get your hands on an affordable set of lenses that covers a various uh, range of focal lengths is more important because that teaches you about perspective and choosing your lenses wisely, along with learning how to compose and light your scenes which are much more important factors when shooting. If you don't master these, no matter how big a sensor you have and no matter how expensive the lenses you get, you won't be able to get the results that, that you want. So I think Micro Four Thirds is a great stepping stone for many beginner photographers and videographers, along with having enough great lenses that even professional photographers and videographers might find themselves satisfied with. 
Alright, those were the three biggest reasons why I would recommend the camera. So as promised, let's talk about the three downsides of this camera that might be deal breakers for some of you and might send some of you looking elsewhere for your photography needs. First up, no microphone jack. Oh, what a bummer this is. It could have saved so much time spent synchronizing audio and video, especially coming from using the 600D, which did have a microphone jack. Right now I'm using my Zoom H1N on a light stand and it records to an SD card and unfortunately it does take a lot of time to line them up in post-production. Obviously using clap tests and audio waveforms and editing programs, I've been able to get pretty quick with synchronizing audio but sometimes every minute counts and even if it's just a few minutes each time, it ends up taking hours of work uh, over months of videos and projects that could be avoided if there was just a microphone jack on the camera that I could plug this microphone in. In the end, videography is about efficiency, so anything that saves you time in the long run is worth paying extra for, in my opinion. The GX9 didn't come with a microphone jack either, so I really really hope that if Lumix in the end chooses to release a GX10, that they include a microphone jack because this is the biggest gripe I have with the Lumix GX85. Okay, the next reason you might want to reconsider getting a GX85 is the lack of a flip up or a flip out screen. The GX85 only has a standard tilt screen and for some people who wish to film themselves especially, that's possibly a deal breaker and even more important than the lack of a microphone jack. Personally for my use case, I spend much more time filming others than filming myself. So not seeing myself is not too big of a problem, although I do understand where people come from. I think it's more of an inconvenience, but as long as I'm not vlogging, there are workarounds. For example, I have this 25 ringgit mirror hack which lets me see the framing of my shot and that lets me adjust my tripod um, and when I have to focus, I end up using the, the Lumix image app because it's quite quick and efficient or I just leave it in continuous autofocus. In good light, I find that the GX85's autofocus is not, it's not too bad. Um, still, considering that cameras like the A6400 have a tilt and flip up screen mechanism and, and cameras like the GF9 have flip up screen mechanism, I think it would be amazing to have it in the GX10. But if I'm honest, I don't see Panasonic doing it because it basically cannibalizes the GF series of cameras which are marketed heavily on having that selfie flip up screen. Oh well, one can still hope and dream. Okay, the last reason is one that um, I think plagues all Panasonic cameras at this point and it has to be the continuous video autofocus. Um, it's the elephant in the room and yeah, it's not great. It's much better than an old DSLR like this um, But I think any for anything other than single point autofocus the camera isn't reliable enough for professional applications Don't get me wrong for photos and an initial acquisition of focus using native lens It's way faster than anyone's needs some of my favorite shots were taken wide open Just pointing the camera in a certain direction and hitting the shutter but for video use, even when I was shooting um, a slow wedding procession rehearsal, I could already feel the camera struggle to keep up with the tracking of subjects. So on the wedding day, I was prompted to take multiple single autofocus clips instead. There's also this weird hunting effect um, that's down to the nature of contrast detect autofocus itself, uh, where the camera overshoots focus and then pulls back in order to acquire focus. Uh, but that means that if you tap the screen, in, even in single autofocus when you are when you're shooting video, your viewers will likely notice that pulse and that doesn't look very professional. Obviously this is unavoidable and it's just a compromise that you have to accept until Panasonic changes to face detect autofocus and if it's a deal breaker for you, you might have to go and consider Sony depending on the kind of shoots that you do. Alright, before wrapping up this video, there are a few nitpicks that I have on about this camera that I just want to point out. First off, there is no auto ISO in manual video mode. Yes, when I do paid work, I always use manual ISO, but I don't see why Panasonic couldn't have put auto ISO just as an option for people who are running and gunning or, or vlogging casually. There is a workaround that involves using shutter priority with a lens that has a dedicated aperture ring, but I don't have such lenses and so I can't try that out. Uh, besides that, I, I wish this camera had um, USB-C rather than micro USB, but I don't think I can complain about it since this camera was released in early 2016. 
You should note that the EVF is pretty mediocre, but I primarily use the screen, so it doesn't bother me too much. And besides that, I think all the other nitpicks that I had have been um, introduced in the successor, the Lumix GX9. Features like the improved sensor, thumb rest, exposure compensation dial, uh, new menus, and Bluetooth connection. Those were really nice to try out when I had my hands on the GX9. But I think, again, these don't really significantly improve my ability to shoot video. So my GX85 will still have its place in my camera collection. So let's conclude. If you are alright with hunting for used deals, I think the Lumix GX85 is one of the best value for money cameras that any beginner videographer or photographer can buy. A couple months ago, my friend managed to snag one up for... Um, 1100 ringgit and that came with a 14mm f2.5 lens which is just insane value. I think if you're able to find a Lumix GX85 kit for less than 150 ringgit um, or $400 as of September 2020, just snag it up. It's a great price and you know if the downsides are deal breakers for you, you can sell it and get back uh, most of the money that you paid. For casual use, this camera is more than enough and I'll go as far as to say that even if you have to use it professionally, it will suffice for non-demanding um, shoots if you know what the camera is capable of. Image quality and user interface is excellent and if you can't get results that you want with this camera, it's probably worth spending more time practicing your composition um, and editing as well as spending your money on lenses, lighting and audio equipment before you decide to upgrade to a better camera with more bells and whistles. I know for sure that as much as I lust over the Lumix S1H, the Sony A7S III, Canon R5, etc, when it comes down to getting work done, this camera has never let me down, especially for its price. Hey, if you made it this far and you liked the video, be sure to leave it a thumbs up. It took me over 10 pages of script to compile all my thoughts together, so I hope at least some of you found this video helpful. I'm planning to release more videos on photography and videography gear uh, to justify some of the expensive purchases I have made over the last year. So if you are interested in that kind of stuff, be sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell. See you in the next one.